All right, everybody, welcome back. It's Matrix Mash number 30. Robert Phoenix and Jasper are both with me. We've got our beanies on, which means we're wired, means we're wired up. We're getting our commands from headquarters and we're ready to go. Robert and Jasper, how you doing? Well, I'm, I'm great uh, and Jasper is greater. Yeah, he is greater <laughs> and he knows it. <laughs> Absolutely, so we have our beanies on tonight. And one of these days I'll figure out how to live stream and then we can kind of do it up like that. But um, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about Tim Pool tonight, but uh, first, how you doing? You have had a, you've had a rough several days. Are you feeling better? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. So Thursday, uh, I just kind of, I hit the wall just on a number of levels. Yeah. Uh, kind of physically, emotionally, psychically, just, I just hit the wall. Yeah. And, and then uh, Friday, I really hit the wall physically. I just, I was, I was, um, there was something going on in my stomach and um, it was, you know, normally I don't tap out when I do a show yeah. and, and I wound up, wound up tapping out on Friday uh, just before the Crimmies were going to be on the show. And yeah, it was, it was not, it was not a, it was not a good, good feeling. And then I wound up sleeping Friday for 15 hours. Good for you. So, um, and then Saturday, I was remotely okay. Sunday, definitely better. Although after Sunday night show, I was pretty gassed. Yeah. Uh, and then Monday, like, okay, I think, I think I'm back in the game. And today, today, today was a good day. I mean, physically. And, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and feeling like I'm kind of on the other side of, whatever whatever happened um prior to january 6th something weird happened psychically mm -hmm. on january 6th there was there was really now that i kind of look because when you're in the moment and you're kind of watching what's happening and that day i was down at uh, the county courthouse and there were a bunch of us um, on the street like, in front of the courthouse and you know, we were, I was live streaming and a lot of people there were there in support of Trump and I remember you know, your live streaming. Yeah, they, they had, you know, they had the, the TV screen on and, uh, and I was like, I'm not into this. Like, I'm really not into like sitting there watching Trump. It's like, let's, let's talk. Let's use this moment to be together, to, you know, try to have one voice, you know, out of many. And uh, so I left before Trump stopped his speech. I'm like, I'm kind of done with this. I don't know where it's going with Trump. And by the time I got back and started to kind of follow up on this thing, like all hell was breaking loose. And I was, I was starting to watch it. And, and I think still, you know, weeks after what happened, people are still trying to put the pieces together, some of which... I think are fairly obvious, some of which are not so obvious, mm -hmm. but something happened energetically in, mm -hmm. in a, in, and not in a good way, mm -hmm. not in a good way. And uh, it feels like, uh, I, I don't want to say reality got hijacked, but it kind of did. Reality got kind of hijacked that day. Yeah. And in the aftermath of that um, has, has been strange yeah deal with because it's not just like what happened that day and basically another astroturfed event another alphabet agency event uh we're dealing with skeletor as president we're dealing we're dealing with you know joe headroom and what are we up to now 55 executive orders uh in how many days going on going on a month and I think he's, I think he's close to 60. I think he's close to 60 executive orders. Now, whether or not these things actually get enacted, so, and, you know, who knows? They're, they're actually executive actions. Mm -hmm. And um, people are starting to kind of notice that, like, that's a heavy pen. And, <laughs> right. Yeah. And they're starting to notice it. And, and it's not just people on the so-called right or the, the the less government better side people on the left are starting to notice wow this is like 
this is this is big, and it's having a it's having a ripple effect. You know, Michael Cisternino, uh, whom we both know, hey Michael, uh, sent me an article on Ralph's and Long's. Was it, it was it was Ralph's and Food for Less in yeah. Long Beach. Do you know the story about this? No. Nope. So this is a this is kind of a, a cascade and domino effect of what's happening in Washington D.C. And the city of Long Beach essentially voted that uh, grocery store workers were going to get four dollars an hour extra okay. added to their pay because of their heroic role in the pandemic. And Food for Less and Ralph's left Long Beach. Like they, they just closed their stores. Yep, we're gone. We're done. Yeah. We're done. And this is this is going to be this is going to be problematic. Mm -hmm. it, it, why is it problematic? Because there's been a precedent set, mm -hmm. it's, and, it, and it, it's a it's a policy precedent. And when when the government is involved in wage and price controls, yep. things 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 go to shit. They go to shit because they're they're using these kind of arbitrary standards to define the marketplace and they're using whatever whatever like cudgel or uh crowbar or wedge they have at their disposal in order to wield their power and they're using the pandemic now the the unions are saying well this is just you know uh, ralph and food for lesses or just Kroger, Kroger owns it. This is Kroger's way of getting out of, you know, having to pay a, you know, a fair wage. Right. But we're going to see more and more of this. In fact, I don't think it's any coincidence that uh, Jeff Bezos announced that he's going to be stepping down as CEO of Amazon. Yeah. And he, he announced that today. Well, well, why is that? Well, guess what? His people want to unionize. Yeah. Now he doesn't, he, in fact, in fact, they wanted to vote online, but, I know. Be but Bezos says, no, you've got to vote in person. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. Right. So he's, he's, he's not getting out. By the way, people should pay attention to this. When Jeff Bezos gets out of the game, you need to pay attention because something big is up. And yeah, he, he probably doesn't want to be involved in the, ultimately the, the woke union politics which is reminiscent of a, of a, of a real socialist society uh, and which is by the way one of the keystones of the black lives matter movement which is unions mm -hmm. uh, so he probably doesn't want to get involved with that that's number one uh, and and be seen as this guy who is anti-union and, and have to deal with all the 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 hate and, and the toxic criticism that goes along with that. But I think there's something even bigger with the economy. Some, something big is going on with the economy. And Michael told me that every single Walgreens in San Francisco is gone. They've left. And well, and, and the reason why is because they were getting robbed blind. I mean, yeah. San Francisco, you can basically steal $999 and 99 cents. Yeah. And they can't do a thing. Which means you could probably steal about two thousand dollars because who's who's counting? Right. Are they are they tallying you up as you leave the store? Uh, I don't think so. So, you know, we're in a we're in a major crisis, and a, and a lot of this now has to do with I think what happened on January sixth. There's there's been this uh, this chaos that's been unleashed, not necessarily a good chaos, although there's I think some neutral elements to it. But we're also seeing the equal but opposite antidote to the chaos, which is severe order coming in, coming in over the top. So we're we're in a weird, weird place and a weird time. And it's not just the United States, you know, it's the world. And you know, we are we are, you know, you know, coming face to face with the new fucking world order. I mean, that's what's happening right now. Yeah. And and people better realize that. Uh, and this this whole thing with 
the coronavirus is the, 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 you know, the, the lockdown and Biden's talking about a, a five-year lockdown. I mean, this, you know, this, is, this is what came out, a five-year lockdown. Now, what do you think that's gonna do to people? He, where, where did you hear this? Today. I, I mean, I, I've, well, I've looked at some news today. I haven't seen anything about a five-year lockdown. So I just- That's, that's the plan. It's a five-year lockdown. And it's not just, that's not just his plan, by the way, that, that is the build, build back better plan. Right. They want, they want five years to essentially remake society. They want five years for this reset. All right. So you said a, a, a lot of stuff. I want to kind of go back and address some of these things. So first of all, like, uh, do you think, first of all, I agree with you. I think something unusual happened on January 6th, aside from just the thing that our attention was directed to. I think there was some sort of um, temp temporal or energy event that occurred uh, probably in multiple places, but definitely in Washington, DC. I don't know if you, we've been talking a bit about temporal pincer movements, which are like, if that's sort of what the uh, movie Tenet was based about, right? Mm -hmm. Which is basically when things from uh, other uh, timelines or realities can basically enter into another one and have a certain amount of time to perform a heist right? But during this time, it's maximum chaos, people coming in from the other side, like, you know, the, the, it's, it's, a, it's a, I mean, in that movie, it's part presented is when you're in the other side, everything is inverted. So you have to wear a mask so that you're not, uh, you know, because of the way your breathing is different. And, uh, you know, you can invert, they have like inverted gun bullets and things like that. But it's basically, you know, you get a certain period of time in that movie, the temporal, pincer, temporal pincer movements are 10 minutes, you have 10 minutes to get in there, and ma maximum chaos to distract from the fact that you're performing a heist, right? You're, you're switching something about that reality in some ways to alter your own timeline, right? So by altering the other kind of thing. So that, and then, you know, just the fact that the entire area in Washington, DC where all this chaos has happened has now been totally empty pretty much ever since then, tells me that something was, was ripped open that day. Um, you know, we, uh, that we just have passed through this um, palindromic temp temporal pincer 10 days of yeah. from 120, so sorry, from 1 2021 until 1 21, where the numbers went like 1 2 0 2 1, 1 2 1 2 1, 1 2 2 2, two right? So it was the same thing forward and backward. Um, so I do think we were in this really odd time, right, where things were being um, moved around. Things were being managed and the sort of uh, energy, like direct, whether some kind of energy weapon or some kind of like frequency or vibrational field that holds that that window and that possibility open. I think it was happening on some level, right? And, and I think it was directed around Washington, D.C., but probably not the only place that it was. And, and then also, um, you know, what do you think about the possibility that just you hit the wall physically. I mean, you've been digging hard and deep into, I mean, for a long time, right? But basically for the last few, for the last years with the coronavirus, but certainly since the chaos, uh, you know, since the election and whatnot, you've been like digging into this really difficult stuff every day, day after day after day. And you're really digging into the minutia of it all. And just at a certain point, like the brain and the adrenal system and the, um, it's it's exhausting right it's exhausting and you just absolutely hit you know hit that wall and what was weird is you hit that wall at the very end of that 10-day palindromic tensoral temporal pincer movement you were done so it was like you were able to maintain your energy through that energetic window right that was kind of crazy and chaos and trying to sort it out and then as soon as that shut you were down dude yeah as soon as yeah. it was over you crashed at the at the finish line <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and it's been really interesting because, um, you know, I've actually had the the thought of, well, am I done? I mean, I mean, I've have I done everything I can from sort of when this thing started to when it theoretically has ended, and I would say the answer is kind of yes and no, and um, because I still think that there's a lot to do and. Um, there's still a lot to uh, untangle, but it's different now. We're living in a different kind of space. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, I, and I'm just kind of getting, you know, I was listening to James Lindsay when we were talking about him uh, 
over the weekend. And one of the things that he talked about that's really interesting is this concept of basically losing your place inside of the narrative. Mm -hmm. And if you lose your place inside of the narrative, uh, then it can be very tricky. It can be, it can be dangerous. You can become dislocated. Mm -hmm. And then you have absolutely no center, no ground, nothing. And, and I felt like for dur during really that sort of the, 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 the temporal pincer period, mm -hmm. um, I, I felt like, I kind of felt like that. I'm like, okay, where am I in this narrative now? Like what is, you know, and, and during that time, uh, YouTube shut me down, mm -hmm. right? YouTube, YouTube shut me down for a week during the, uh, the inauguration. And it was, and it, and it felt, it felt very specific mm -hmm. because I, by their community guidelines and standards, I did not violate their community guidelines and standards and get a second strike. Like if you go to my, well, if I went to my YouTube page, I'd have one strike, not two, one strike. And yet they shut me down for, you're supposed to be done for two weeks. And I was done for a week. It was like, okay, let's just, let's just take them out for a week. And that was, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. And not entirely unexpected because, you know, I've cruised through YouTube for a whole year and I've had a few things pulled down, but, you know, they haven't been, you know, striking me with the baton. So it was like, okay, well, that was going to happen eventually. It happens to everybody eventually. But if you, if you look at the amount of times that I've, you know, streamed, like there are people that have been kicked off of YouTube four or five times, like uh, uh, James Corbett's had to deal with, I don't know, how many suspensions on YouTube, quite a few. So it was, it was not unexpected, but it was kind of in that place. It was like, Oh God, I normally do this every day and I'm not doing it. Yeah. Like, you know, what do I do? And, and it felt, you know, and it, you know, people have, um, you know, come to, you know, tune in to my podcast because, you know, for, you know, for whatever reason, it's been, you know, it's been kind of an island of sanity in some ways. Like, you know, oh, you know, great. You know, somebody's talking about things in a way that I can understand and it's taking some of the tension off of what I'm experiencing and feeling. And I can laugh a little bit and, and the presentation is kind of interesting. And, oh, what about this chat room? This chat room is kind of interesting. And, you know, so, you know, I was getting lots of emails. Mm -hmm. Like, Me too. Robert, I was getting, I, I got more emails and more text messages and more messages on my own YouTube channel asking me where you are than I ever get about myself. So people love you. <laughs> no, so, so there, there was that too. And I'm like, you know, there are people who have come to depend on me. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's kind of, it's not that I, I, I you know, I'm not, uh, conscious of it and aware of it and, and willing to live up to that agreement, which I clearly am. But when you have that sense that that is true, then there's this um, feeling and a commitment to get back there because you know that, that I complete some kind of a circuit for them. And that's when I scramble around and, and, I, and I found Mixler for a week, yeah. which was, which was good. It was fine. And, and People got to hang out and chat and, you know, I got this thing up and running in what a day, really. Yeah. I, I missed a day. And, and then, you know, I had to do the Friday forecast, you know, and I just did a pre-record with Ross Ben, got that up. So, you know, that was good for me because it, it kept me, you know, in the game and it kept me, you know, moving forward. And then, and then of course, last Monday, the return to, to YouTube and which was interesting. Um, it, and still, you know, ha dealing with the fact that I can't rely on this thing. Uh, and, but, you know, and it was good. But at the same time, you know, whatever, whatever was going on with this temporal pincer in the in these days, uh, I was I was really feeling it. I, I was really, really feeling it. And 
the 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 thing that really I don't want to use the word trigger. I hate that word, but the thing that catalyzed me to or moved me to you know not not stream on Friday was I'd gotten a recording from Marina Darkstar, who is a really good astrologer and a, a really good person. I know who she is, yeah. Yeah, and um, Marina and I are, you know, we, we chat every now and then. We're not, you know, we're close, but we don't chat all the time, but we're, we're definitely close. And she sent me something and it, it was, she was concerned because somebody had sent her basically a death threat. And, um, and it was, it was not a death threat that I would take seriously as a, as a death threat with somebody from the United States and threatening to call the FBI or whatever, but the energy of it, it's the energy, right? Wishing somebody dead, yeah. like, and finding their email and, and doing that. And I listened to her and I just started to kind of feel this, you know, this kind of this anxiety. It, w- it wasn't even really my anxiety. It was, you know, and that's happened before. You know, I've, I've sometimes I've connected into this collective anxiety. It's like, where's yeah. it coming from? I don't, I don't have any reason to feel anxious, but it was there. And so there was that. And then, you know, hitting the wall physically, you know, blue, I'm, I'm done. I'm done for the weekend. Yeah. Um, and then I came back on on Sunday night. And after Sunday night show, I, two hours, I was, I was still kind of gassed. Yeah. But whatever happened, whatever, whatever I went through, like I'm through it now. Yeah. And, uh, so with, with a, you know, with a bit of a different perspective and, and, um, and my health, my health is fine. You know, it's some, some, and by the way, I'm not the only one. Uh, I know a couple of other people, at least two other people who, who've been down sick, having this weird stomach thing. And, and, um, you know, it's interesting. Hen, um, Henry Bacow, I want to, I want to, I'm going to bring this up because this is actually something that you, Emily, and the audience would be interested in. Can I do a screen share on this? I just gave you a screen share. Okay. I'll make you so, you, uh, Okay, so let me, let me do this. So I, I actually like Henry's website. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he posts something every day, or if he doesn't, he has people that you know will guest post. Anyway, this is a pretty interesting post, and it, the uh, headline here is: COVID test may contain worm-like vaccine. Mm-hmm. So this um, these star-shaped micro devices. Sophia Smallstorm and I did a, a show a couple weeks ago about this. Yep. And this is the stuff that I, so this is, I'm telling you right now that they tested this in the meth first, right? Because there, if you read the article, it talks about how it's in the nasal passage direct to brain. And of course, people talk about how this burns. Well, what else burns when you show it up your nose, right? Meth. So that's a good place to hide this stuff. I used to pull these things out of my, out of my body, Robert, these exact we, things. You and I have had this conversation. Yeah. I have as well. Yep. I know these things. Mm-hmm. And they've been around and, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't do math during the time that you were doing that. Um, you know, that, that was a long time ago in my life and just briefly, but there, I believe that this stuff is in the atmosphere. This is, this is part of the nano dust. This is part of the chemtrail dispersal as well. And these are the nano machines that are self-assembling. Yep. And that's what they become. They assemble and they become these things. Yep. And and I think that they can hang out in any part of your body, but I think that they hang out in your gut. Totally. They hang out in your gut. And, and I, I pulled them out of a variety of places in my body, right? Like I pulled them out of my face mostly. Um, yep. but they were entering through here. I think that what they do is they assemble into this and then they're this for a while. And then when they're done doing their, I, I don't think that they last forever, right? They break up because I pulled each of these. So stay on that star, right? I pulled multiple times each of these little individual pieces 
that are on there, things like that out, but also the clear stuff that is holding them together, like the background tape, right? Like those points and these pieces of sort of plastic or silicon, like yeah. I would pull things like that out of my skin. And I also have had the experience of like having something under my skin going to try and pull it out and then it literally grabbing on to Absolutely. something inside Absolutely. like that and getting into a tug of war and literally ripping. I have this scar on the side of my face here from when I literally had to rip one of those off my face. Right. Yep. And you know what the craziest part about it, Robert, was after I ripped it off the skin, I was bleeding. There was a huge gouge in my cheek. The skin just within a matter of minutes, literally closed back up and sealed. So there's something that's going on inside the body that that has created that 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 made like the skin closed and you could still see underneath that there had been blood there. It was like a clear piece of skin over blood. Right. But it sealed right up within minutes. It was like you were why I was watching a sci fi movie or some fucking shit like that. It was one of the weirdest and most terrifying things I had ever witnessed. So, you know, my my experience with these things usually had to do with uh, my nasal passages. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I would actually and this, so they would usually start off in like a hexagonal polymer. Yep. Yep. Hexagonal polymer. And then out of that hexagonal polymer, these little hooks. Yep. I know exactly what you're talking about. Would that would then sort of begin to insert themselves, right? Yeah. So I would usually get them before the, the hook phase. Mm -hmm. And they would usually come out of my nasal passage or my mouth. Yep. One time, pretty graphic. I had one of these things on the head of my member okay yeah it was there and yeah. it was like it was a wtf moment yeah and, and i and i and i had to pull it off and it was it was painful Fucking painful i i, I know it what was, i pulled i have a scar down like you know sort of in the groin area from where i pulled one out it wasn't yeah. quite in as a sensitive a place of yours um no. but yeah i mean and it's this was this was this started for me like in the mid 2000s, right? So there was not all the information about it that there is now. And like, you know, when you're, when you're going through this, you're fucking, you're like, what the fuck am I doing, dude? I'm like, I, what am I, like, there's the question about, can this, is this even fucking real? Like what on earth is going on here? And you yeah. can't tell people about it, right? You can't tell people about it. And like, literally sometimes I would go through a fight with something like this for a couple of hours, right? To get something like this off of and out of my body. Um, you know, and then, you know, things would just kind of close up and, and heal and it was weird, you know, whatever, but this went on for a couple years, for years with me, you know, and it wasn't until I, you know, stopped doing nothing, changed my diet that it stopped. Right. So I, they, they really like, um, so I think it was entering through the meth. I don't know what was going on for you, maybe the environment you were living in or some product you were taking. What's interesting to me is I went one time to I see Alana Freeland speak, right? And she speak, speaks to, the, there's a group here in Los Angeles about chemtraily kind of stuff, right? And um, they meet up and it's not really my kind of thing because it becomes more of like a support group or complaining about stuff and whatever. I just, I'm past that, that part of my experience. I understand yeah. the phase people have to go through, but it's not interesting to me anymore. And it doesn't usually get you anywhere. Yeah. But the people there, there were all of these people there complaining about the same things that I was experiencing when this was happening to me was on when I was on meth and I'm a hundred percent sure they're not on meth but I bet you I know some things that they might be on and that might be some of the products that we've been told through alternative health are good for you and I'm not suggesting that the purveyors that, that the people who create these products are in on it but where, where are the products going in between when you buy it and when it arrives at your house right these nutritional health powders there are things to put in your, you know, all kinds of different stuff, right? I mean, there's a variety of ways it can be happening. Obviously, we're dealing with chemtrails and GMO foods and stuff like that, too. But some of these people who were in this community, like, felt, I felt like I was, it was not any different than sitting around with the group of people I used to do meth with 15 years ago. They're right. talking about the same shit, and they're experiencing the same symptoms. Yeah, yeah. Well, they just started to uh, ramp up the geoengineering again. Yeah, heavy in, 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 a, in a big in a big way, mm -hmm. and and I and I think that these uh, these critters are they're nanos, they're mm -hmm. they're self assembling nanobots, 
And they're probably not just in the air, they're probably in our food. They're probably in packaged or processed food. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would bet that, you know, we never talked about leaky gut. Like leaky gut was never a thing. Right. Like in the 70s, 80s, even in the 90s. It's this. People didn't talk about leaky gut. This, this stuff started to show up in the late 90s, in the early 2000s. And I think that's when leaky gut started to show up because you've got these, 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 uh, you know, these little claw motherfuckers getting into your intestines yep. and then poking holes in them. That's the same that's thing that like basically fungus does. So what I recognized after a short bit of time working with Amber Oak, right, was that what these things kind of do is they're like a, synth they do, it's like a synthetic or a, a nanotechnology version of the same activity that candida, yeast, fungus, and parasites do in the body, right? It's just a mechanized version of the same thing that likes the same environment. So it likes a, an environment with a lot of sugar. It likes an environment, I, yes, all yes. that kind of stuff, right? And so, which yep. is why when I change the diet, I, it, you know, it, at least it goes through you faster or so, some other things that I figured out as well. But these, that's what these things are. If you hear Cliff Carnicom, he'll call them cross domain bacteria. So there's elements to them that behave like a, an organic thing. And then there's elements where they're behaving like synthetic technology or something like that, right? And, and they literally do. That, that process that you're talking about is the same thing that happens once yeast has overgrown and starts to sort of turn into fungus and it starts to bore holes in the gut lining. So exactly like this, once it's organized itself into the thing, then it curls around and pokes in. Well, I, I think that there is a symbiotic relationship between these things and fungus. Totally. Right? And, and and I, this is this is my whacked out theory, but my theory is that these little things actually live off of the fermentation of the totally. fungus. Like that's that's their fuel. That's that's what kombucha. Kombucha yeah. is the perfect uh, stew for these to like flourish in, right? Yeah. So yeah. everything that people, you know, there has been while well, we've been bombarded with propaganda about how important it is not to eat meat and stuff like that. Right. There's been no propaganda about uh, avoiding sugar. Right. And then this push, this idea that fermented foods are really good for you and that you should eat them. They're only actually really good for you once your gut is actually are, is in balance. Right. If your gut is out of balance and you're eating fermented stuff all the time, it, it, it's not good. And, and the ferment kinds of fermented foods people are eating are not the right kind. All the, if you see a fucking aisle full of something at Whole Foods, it's not good for you. If there is something good for you at Whole Foods, it's on, like off to the side in the corner and it's almost never there. You're lucky if you find one kind of thing. There's not 47 flavors, right? They're not by the, on the end caps, by the cash register. Kombucha, like when it first became a thing, like people would have a little tiny bit of it and they'd make it themselves and it tasted like shit. It wasn't sweet. And it's a little thick tonic you take occasionally, fine. Same with something like kimchi or sauerkraut, a little bit once in a while, really well made, right? And fermented in a very particular way. It has to be fermented correctly, but it's not for someone, you're not gonna, when I hear somebody, I see, used to see this at the health food store, They're trying to get rid of candida as they buy like a huge three gallon jug of kombucha, right? And I'm like, for fuck's sake, I just, I'm not even gonna waste my time trying to explain it to them. But yeah. you know, this, this, this stuff is not like, it's not really, the panacea. The first thing Anne told me when I started working for don't once you you're, once you're all healed up, you can have some of that stuff occasionally. Never kombucha, right? And the other thing is with even the way like with tofu and stuff in the Orient, if it's eaten properly, it's fermented in a very certain way, and right. it comes from very a certain kind of soybeans and whatnot. Like the way that they, mostly they don't ferment it here, but if they do it, they do it improperly. So all the things that people think that they're doing that are good for that they, they think are the anecdote or the solution or, or whatever are actually increasing, like they're creating the right environment and the symbiotic relationship that you're talking about, right? So the same environment, sugar, like gut flora, out of balance, um, adrenal shot, all that kind of stuff that, that candida and yeast and fungus thrive in, that's the same shit that the Morgellons and the nanotechnology thrives in. It's the yep. same shit. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's like, the, you know, it's so absolutely. Okay, were you, were you going somewhere else with that story? I had one more thing I wanted to respond to to what you said earlier, and then we can move on to some uh, topics. No, I just, I just, you know, that just popped into my head because um, I've just noticed, like recently, more people kind of going through 
something similar. And and it's and I definitely think it's connected to the ramp up of the geoengineering and mm -hmm. the aerosol spraying. And all of a sudden, you know, people are they're not feeling well. They're feeling lethargic, or you know, they've taken in something that's all of a sudden, you know, trying to set up shop in their in their intestines. And so, I, you know, people need to be. You know, we're we're in a war. Okay, this is we're in a fucking war. We're in a spiritual, psychic, physical, and emotional war. And this is, it's sort of hard to grasp, but this is like fifth generation warfare. It's not even fourth generation warfare because they're employing things like, like the geoengineering and psychotronics and this rollout of, you know, wokeism. And, and um, so, you, you know, you, you've got to understand this. And you, you, you have to, you have to take care of your body. And, you know, this is the first line of defense. And then you've got to take care of your mind and you've got to take care of your emotions and you've got to take care of your spirit. These are really important things. And really the most important thing in my opinion to take care of right now is your diet, because that, that's the, the, alchemizing your internal environment, right? Yeah. That is actually the one thing you have a lot of control over, yeah. right? Your time is really well spent doing that. But you know, my other thought is, Remember we had the conversation in the summer during like the George Floyd riots, how I noticed the, some of the odd behavior of people and, and whatnot. And it seemed like they were being triggered by something and whatnot. Think about this. All these people who were at the Capitol, how many of them have probably had tests, right? Have had at least one, but maybe multiple of these tests, right? So for the first time in some of their lives, their body is full of all of this nanotechnology, right? That maybe you and I were exposed to through either some kind of targeting or some other thing prior in our life and then they're there and there's some sort of like really weird temporal or energetic thing going on and people just lose their shit like it's psychotronic weaponry and there is uh, you know satellite dishes in their body to receive commands <laughs> yeah i mean I, I i think there are a lot of really unanswered questions about what happened on on january 6th i mean astrologically i mean it, it was it was not good yeah i mean we're dealing with these these hard ass squares with Mars and Uranus and Jupiter and Saturn uh, had just gone into Aquarius. I mean, there was there was a lot happening astrologically. Um, the other thing, and, and I wanted to I wanted to share this as well. People, yeah. you know, this is a pretty hip group, so you guys are probably well aware of the uh, the so called sacred geometry of yeah. Washington D.C. Oh, yeah. Washington DC is uh, Washington DC is a grid. Mm -hmm. Let me let me show you how intense the layout of Washington DC is. Yep. So this is uh, Pierre Lafont, this supposedly, right? Supposedly. You know, if you if you go into the Tartarian story, there's probably something already there. Yep. And then what they did is they decided to, hey, look what we found. Let's 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 anchor this in a different way, and maybe we can actually build on it, right? So this guy, you know, Pierre the infant, Pierre the child, right? That's right. Love, right? Interesting name. Mm -hmm. uh, suppose supposedly was the person who developed the grid. Yep. Washington D.C. Whether he did or not. Well, look at what we have here. So the Capitol's in the center of everything, yep. right? There's the mall. Yeah. And it's interesting because that whole event started off at the ellipsis. So just so we know, this is like, this is a four lobe shape, right? It's one representation, one way. It's a very basic way of representing a Templar's cross, fifth element in the middle being the capital, right? Tem Templar doesn't sound that different than temporal. Right. Right. That's true. So this is a Absolutely. space where that those kinds of movements are very easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a circle again, theoretically, the circle was then drawn centered on the capital, mm -hmm. uh, the beginning point, which was at 0.618 mile in diameter. Mm -hmm. And then you have another one. You have the Pisces Vesica right here. Yeah. And it represents the golden ratio of one to 1.168. Mm -hmm. And then the second circle was then drawn. At its center was one mile east of the capital with an iron one mile. So here we go, form the Vesica Pisces yep. uh, or the Mandorla is the uh, Western equivalent of the Asian yin yang symbol. Uh, the point which the opposite 
takes on the other's qualities and resolution. So here we go. Now we're starting to see this thing mm -hmm. get flushed out, right? So the Pisces Vesica, we have, you know what this looks like? This looks like CERN. No, I mean, everything that matters these days does. I mean, I've been spending a lot of time looking at particle colliders and, and things like that, right? And what they actually really and truly are. And I'm convinced that that's what's under the ground at these parts that are the sort of where these Tartarian buildings are. These are power points in the earth. People didn't put them there. They've always been there. And it is something that they discover and they pretend that they control them, but they learn how to do things sort of in harmony with them. And they don't tell everyone else about it, right? They act like it is some creation of theirs. I like this picture here. Go ahead. Right. So if you break it up, this is what it looks like. Yep. A series of cascading stars. That's exactly right. I mean, I, I, did you ever, have you gone and looked at all at that channel I told you about, the FPV Angel? No, you keep telling me I need to go. Yeah, there. I mean, this this is the underground side of what this is, is what they're talking about, basically. And that all these things that we see in the sky, a lot of the things we experience and then the things that they use to try, they're trying to cover up the reflection of the inner workings of what's going on underground. So it's reflected in the sky and then they're covering that up. But even the things that are the reflection, right, they're interactive as well. So like the luminaries, right, interact with the environment, even though they're reflections of nodes in the machinery underground, but they have their own interactive sort of technological aspect to them as well. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. And they have figured out how to build things in geometric harmony and proportion, right, to them around some of these power spots. And they're, they're high energy places. And for people who know how to use that high energy, they sure take advantage of it. And they don't tell other people about it. And that's all they're doing. They didn't actually build these things. Right. So yeah. here we go, right? The grid system came last and is based on a pattern of cascading stars. There's your luminaries. Yep. Certain streets of major significance were set by the alignment of the star points and the edges. 8th Street, for instance, halfway to the White House is particularly important. The large grid that emerged from this was then further subdivided by quarters or eights, giving the grid arrangement that syncopated look described earlier. The avenues are thus not simply overlaid on top of the grid. Instead, the grid emerges out of the angles, points, and intersections. Yeah, look at that big sort Sorry of like eye, the Vesica Pisces upside down, eye shaped in the middle. Yep. So interesting. Yeah. And, and you've, course, got, you've got the flower of life going on right flower here. Flower of life, Vesica Pisces, uh, certain aspects of, you know, some other geometric designs that aren't as well known. And then also, I know that there's like, if you look at it from up above, there's like, it looks like an owl as well, right? Um, but yeah, there's all kinds of geometries going on there. And it would be really interesting to know the path some of these people walk, took, right? Like, you know, when they were walking from one spot to the next spot and whatnot, and how much energy was, you know, running along those currents, right? So this is, uh, this is interesting. It says, um, much has been made of the secret of math and geometry involved and what potential nefarious intent this implies to some minds. This is the sort of thing that worries various strains of Christians, but it means these are the same principles that were used in the design of Solomon's temple. Oh, that makes it okay. For instance, what Lafont was after was to symbolically represent the uniting of heaven and earth. That well, the American- Is it a reflection of what the, in the sky, of what's going on below the ground, yep. Mm -hmm. And then the number six shows up quite a bit here, obviously. Mm -hmm. We know that it would. Um, so, you know, we've got this, let me do this. So just look at this image, right? Just remember, just remember this image, right? Okay. And, then, and then let's look at CERN really quickly so people know what we're talking about. Yep. I, I've been showing these, yeah, I mean, I, this is this is the same stuff I've been showing people in reference to other, you know, kind of different topics that I've been doing, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And here we have the Vesica Pisces again. Mm -hmm. It's there, it, I saw a lot, same geometries, yep. And, um, okay, so here, this is, this is what CERN looks like. Like, this yeah. is one of the Hadron Colliders. Yeah, and then they have this small. They're, build, they're building a third one. 
Yep. And the third one would then complete sort of that mirror image of yep. what looks like three Hadron Colliders yep. uh, in Washington, uh, DC. So whatever happened on the 6th, right, that was completely amplified. Yeah, like, right. like, I mean, that's why I think it was significant because not just what was happening astrologically, but also with all the emotion, like there was a lot of emotion there. Yeah. A lot yeah. of emotion, which quickly turned into like angst and desperation and then uh, sort of bottoming out. And then you have this, you know, very, this version of a, of a Hadron Collider built into the grid and then a whole lot more. So, you know, this gets into some, some very strange, like kind of hyper-dimensional possibilities. Totally, this is exactly what, where we, I've been going with stuff. You've got to watch The Man in the High Castle, okay? You've got to watch this whole thing with the Dynevenvelt, right? And the new world and, you know, the movement between them and whatnot. There is a lot of weird hyper-dimensional outer, re other reality kind of stuff at play here. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're kind of coming into some of the same kind of stuff because this is where it's at, dude, right? Like things that are not paying attention to how permeable and uh, malleable time and space are right now, you, for, you know, are missing it. Everything else is largely a distraction, <laughs> you know? Um, I wanted to, um, before we kind of move on to some other topics, I wanted to just circle back and maybe this actually will lead into what maybe will be our first topic. You said in the, a while back about how people on the left are starting to get it with the heavy pen, right? This whole thing with the executive orders is ridiculous. Like I actually did listening to listen to Peggy Hall the other day talking about how she's done a lot of research on the law and executive actions actually only apply to people who work for the federal government. That's right. right. That's right. Yep. And, so the fa and he, that's, I mean, that's essentially all he's been doing is signing papers basically signing these things and sometimes he wasn't even signing them or putting a seal on them or whatever. Right, so there's something right. weird. I mean, there's all sorts of weird shit going on. Um, but I, what, one of the things that I've noticed is I actually think there's a lot of power coming out of the smart, principled, moral and reasonable left right now, like maybe more interesting stuff than the right, you know, and certainly out of the, you know, the, the people who used to follow a character from Stress Sesame Street, right? <laughs> a letter, a letter that was sponsored by Sesame Street, you know, like I listened to Glenn Greenwald on with Jimmy Dore the other day talking about how, you know, uh, the, the, the kind of censorship that was going on and a lot of these people who were like the anti-war left, you know, they were, um, they were, you know, kind of okay with, the, you know, they were getting censored too. And there had been a lot of lefties who had not really said anything when the right got, you know, censored, right? And then they were experiencing it, but he was straight up and said, just, you, it's not even a good enough reason, right? To defend the right of someone else you disagree with to speak so that you can speak. You just defend the right to free speech because it's the right thing to do, right? Like that this thing that we do where it's like, well, I'll support you know, this kind of like, you know, he was having no, ifs, ands, or buts about it. Like you either support free speech or you don't, right? Like not, so, not some iteration of it, some version of it or whatever. And you don't hear, you know, that kind of, you know, strong talk that often from people on the left, but then also people, and I'm super glad that you've turned some of your attention to people like James Lindsay and Pete Bogosian, because I actually feel like um, th they're presenting something that is a sanity that is shareable in a way that certain other kinds of material that people from alternative communities have been attracted to in the past wasn't so shareable because it wasn't so reflective of history. When you listen to James Lindsay talk, he's measured, he's calm, he knows his history, right? And he has developed, he's been able to sort of move it, move it into like a modern way of speaking about it. And this is a guy who considers himself to be of the left and hasn't been afraid to go against other members, like to really, you know, piss off people who are his peers. I think that James Lindsay and Pete Bogosian were always like, that was where the good stuff, they were, they were sort of peripheral members of the intellectual dark web, right? And all the people who were focused on heavily have turned out to be basically 
putzes or corruptible or disappeared and you know or whatever it is and these two are over there kind of you know and, and helen pluck rose as well although she's a little bit different but the way that they have kind of demonstrated what's wrong with the system and then right now the project that james Lindsay is doing and, and the way he is sort of presenting information I feel like this is a lot better place for people to spend their time and energy than like chasing down the next drop. Or no, I, I, I totally, I totally agree. I mean, uh, I, I really wasn't aware of him and uh, the new discord right. started yeah. to show up on my YouTube feed. And I think I've, I think I watched about half a dozen um, over the weekend. And then I think I watched like maybe three presentations by Peter Bogosian, one which was at Portland State which was really good. And I highly recommend it. You know, he, he teaches there and it was a reverse Q and a, and there were people who go to school there and they were basically encouraged to talk about their experience inside the system that forces them to accept ideas like uh, critical race theory and intersectionality and postmodern syntax and, you know, all that stuff. And at first, nobody wanted to go up and talk. And then the ice broke, cracked, and then the whole thing just like, you know. Oh, that's good. I haven't seen that one. I'll, I'll have to check that it, one out. It's, it, it's, re it's really good. And it's it's the, the thing that, 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 you know, because I've been out of college for a long time. And when I was in college, it was like, you know, anything goes, really. I mean, if you have a good position and you want to be able to and I was an English major, so you know I would you know, write certain papers or whatever. Um, but I, you know, we certainly weren't forced, intellectually forced, or academically forced mm -hmm. to, to alter our point of view or adapt a point of view that uh, the faculty or the curriculum wanted us to adapt. That, there, even, there, even when I went to college, I didn't have to do that. There was not. There was none of that. That's not the case now. Yeah. And, and if you don't include something in your paper about critical race theory or intersectionality and, and tie it together so that the person grading your paper thinks that you get it, you will, you will fail that paper yep. and you will fail that class and you will flunk out of college. And whether it's your hard earned money that you've saved to go to college or the onerous student debt you have to pay back, like that is weighing on your mind. Yeah. So you you kind of do what you're told, and this is what comes out of that. You do what you're told. You kind of you know play around with the ideas and get them to think that you know that you know that they know that you know what you're talking about. Yeah. No, I I, I it's it's very interesting. I've been following him him for a couple of years. Right, like he was, like he really grabbed my attention right away when I sort of discovered him. Partly because he has a good sense of humor and whatnot, um, and just he's he's all he's principled. Like he's just principled, and he doesn't have like something that's like, oh well, I make an excuse for this thing or whatever. Like he's totally principled. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you found him. The interview he did on American Thought Leaders about uh, the new Leninism was pretty interesting too. I don't know if you've checked that one out or not, but. Uh, I think that one, like, that's actually something that, like, is shareable with people. Like, I could probably send that to my dad, and if he would actually listen to it, he would he would understand it, because my dad studied some of those things, right, when he was a kid, right? He's speaking in a way, he's, his knowledge and grasp of history and of these um, collectivist and authoritarian and totalitarian movements that have happened prior to now, um, the way he describes them and he's not presenting any information from a left or right wing point of view but seriously just from a historical and philosophical point of view right and it's just it's 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 academic in nature in the way that a cat ac ac academia is supposed to be yeah absolutely and but he he does make the point that uh socialism marxism communism leads leads societies into a blender every time yeah and uh, people don't understand that, and uh, I wanted. To, okay, um, hold on a second. So one of the things that he brought up. Let me see if I can find this. Okay, so he talks about 
the K K Kambahi River Collective. Do you, do you know about this group? No. So we're essentially living in their paradigm. Okay. Uh, one of the women, so the Kambahi River Collective was a group of black feminist, lesbian, socialist women in Boston. Okay. <laughs> No, this is so. This is that th they have mapped out this idea of critical race theory, and we are essentially living in their paradigm. Okay, it sounds about right to me. And this woman, one of the one of the uh, one of the people who is associated with this movement. Um, is sort of the leading voice of critical race theory. Which one? Uh, let me see if I can find her here. See if I recognize her name. My sister. So this, 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 My sister this, loves this, this stuff. So they, so they, they said feminism is not enough. Right. Like so, that the, the feminism is inherently wrong yeah. because it, it wasn't tied to race. This is the Wikipedia page. Okay, so uh, numbers. Cheryl Clark. I'm not familiar with any of these names, but no, that's not her. She doesn't know. It's not Cheryl Clark. Who is it? Um, is it Beverly Smith. Let me see. No, it's not here. This woman, this woman was born in 1961. But these are the women that were that comprised uh, this collective. Yeah. And it's Barbara Smith. Yeah, uh, I think it's Barbara Smith. Is this it? Is this her? Yeah. So this is this is the world that we're basically living in now. It was it was carved out by this collective. Yep. And uh, Black Lives Matter is sort of a, a maybe second or third generation version of this. And Black Lives Matter, run by three lesbian, black African American or Latino yeah. black mixed women. Yeah, and they're all they've all acknowledged that they're Marxists and all, trained Marxists and all that stuff. Yeah. Right, so their ideological and spiritual grandmothers is this collective. Yeah, and this is this is the world that that is being cast cast upon us. This is the spell that is being cast upon us, and people people don't realize it. People don't understand this, and this is this is the territory that James Lindsay gets into. Yep, and he's not he's not afraid to go there because he's figured out how to address this stuff and untangle the, the spell. Because when you get into the language, the language is a spell. Yeah, well, he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's a, uh, got a PhD in mathematics, right? Yeah. So there's something different that, I mean, you know, like it sounds a little unusual, like, oh, I was a professor of mathematics and now I'm doing this. But there's a certain, you know, different kind of like slightly detached logic that he's able to look at some of this stuff from, which is the, um, you know, probably result of having to work out equations in his life. You know what I mean? Uh, in, in a way that has nothing to do with feelings, really, right? Kind of thing. Uh, he's Absolutely. An, yeah, he's an interesting guy. Um, I haven't heard of those people, but that stuff, I mean... <laughs> you know, my family is knee deep in that stuff. My family, you know, like it's, it's fascinating to sort of um, be from a family who I'm just like, so at this point, diametrically opposed in terms of like the way that I see the world, right? Like I do have some of the same sort of core values that, that I was raised with, but it has resulted in a completely different perspective on the world than every, almost everyone else in my family has, and they love that stuff. <laughs> well, 
at some level, it's you know, it's all kind of heady. And if you understand, if you figure out uh, the word magic yeah. around intersectionality and critical race theory, which comes out of postmodernism, yeah. um, you can have a sense of being able to twist things around and apply a certain uh, skewed and loaded logic and use it against people. Yep. And, and most people don't understand sort of the rules of engagement in that world. That video you showed this morning, uh, well, you showed two really good videos. That I think they were from this morning, the young girl in the Target who were says telling people they're being brainwashed. And then the video with Thomas Sowell and Francis Fox Piven and, and Milton Friedman. My, you know, my mom was an economist. My mom had, you know, uh, she got her PhD in economics from UCLA, but she was also a student of the Milton Friedman sort of system of economics, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting that, you know, she and my father were married and, you know, it's sort of kind of like, you know, opposing, you know, some sort of, I guess I'm some sort of Hegelian dialectic that came out. <laughs> it came out of that, uh, that project or whatever, but uh, that video was great. Both those videos that you showed this morning were great. Um, Cheryl Harris is the woman. Ah, I'm not familiar with her. Her son uh, Earl is Earl Sweatshirt, and uh, he he's he's part of this like L.A. collective, uh, this L.A. hip hop collective, Odd Future. Do you know? Do you know? Mm -hmm. Like Ty Tyler, the creator. Do you know Tyler, the creator? Yeah. No, it, Tyler, the creator is not Tyler Perry. <laughs> I, don't no. get, I don't know. I don't no, know. No. I've heard of Tyler, the creator, but I don't know who he is. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, her son is Earl Sweatshirt, and he's, he's part of the uh, odd future. Well, you see, like, there are, there's a lot of these rappers who are dating people like um, Naomi Osaka, right, who is, like, you know, to using, been using the last year and all of her masks and stuff to, you know, project Black power and all of that kind of stuff, and, and he's, you know, he's from that sort of scene, probably, my guess would be that same sort of hip-hop scene here in Los Angeles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So getting back to that video with Thomas Sowell and Francis Fox Piven, mm -hmm. like Francis Fox Piven had a mustache. <laughs> and so was this really a woman? I don't know. I, I was looking at the face I'm like this could, actually, it, Robert. <laughs> this could be this could be a dude. Right. This could, this could actually be a dude. Dude looks like a lady. But you need so people, this is this is. I'm telling you, if you want to understand wokeness and critical race theory and intersectionality and all that stuff, you need to get training. You need to understand where they're coming from, right? So you need to understand that and you need to be able to disassemble their arguments. You, you have a guy like Thomas Sowell and Milton Friedman. Mm -hmm. I mean, these guys, they're, they're, they're like, freaking sequoia trees in 100 mile per hour gales and they're and they're not moving they're yeah. not budging and thomas Sowell basically made mincemeat out of francis fox pivot yep yeah no and, and, then, and then he has wingman friedman there who said hey and i really like milton friedman i yeah. may not agree with everything but i but i you know if you ever watch videos of milton friedman and there's plenty of them on on, on youtube mm -hmm. he's always happy He's always happy. He's always smiling. Um, he's he's and he loves talking to people and he loves teaching and he loves talking about economics and and the free market capital and 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 economic system. I mean, it's, it, it's his videos are really engaging. Yeah. And there's there's this one. He won the Nobel Prize and, and he went to. Uh, I talked about this today. How he helped Chile. He helped Chile with their economy. Yeah, I actually talked about it yesterday, and he went to uh, Sweden to get the uh, the Nobel Prize, and there was a heckler in the audience. He'd gotten a ticket from his father, and he was basically saying that you know, he had to leave. The, the Swedes don't heckle very well, um, but he had to leave. And and I'd never seen Friedman, and I watched quite a few hours of his videos. I'd never seen him look cross or have any kind of discomfort, he could have killed that guy. Like, here he is, this is his moment, he's getting a Nobel Prize, he's a Leo, 
So he was having a Leo moment. Yeah. He was having, and he and his wife were adorable. I mean, they they they're they, they together for 65 years and she was an economist and they met at the University of Chicago because alphabetically her name came after his. Ah, that's that's how, yeah. That's that's how they met. So Milton Friedman, Friedman is probably rolling over in his grave at the idea that Black oh. Lives Matter is nominated for a, a Nobel Peace Prize, right? Well, both he and Sol argue against equity-based outcomes. Totally. And yeah, it's not not good. Not no. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and Friedman not down with uh, government intervention around wage and price control. Mm -hmm. And you know, UBI is government intervention. Well, so it takes us back to the Ralph's food for less thing exactly. from earlier as well. So yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So and, and Friedman passed away, I think, what, 90, 95, I think. Sometime in the nineties, yeah. You know, 20 years and rough what are we 95, yeah. 2015, so 25 years. Um we're living we're living in an alternate universe now. Yeah. We're no we're no longer living, we're living in New Schwabia. Uh we're not living in Milton Friedman's uh universe anymore. But Thomas Sowell is still around and he's still, you know, the guy's still got a fastball. Yeah. And and um so I highly look. What's happened is that, and this gets back to what you were saying about the next drop. Mm -hmm. um, people, Q became a consumer experience. Yep. Q was a producer and it became a consumer experience. And you would just, people would just sit there and consume like the drop or the interpretation of the drop and people weaving together these, you know, tapestries of possibility. And that ultimately creates a really lazy and uh, slack mentality. Yeah. Well, they also weren't doing it with really topics of, of like, like high intellect, right? They weren't doing it with art and music and philosophy and thought or whatever. They were doing it with very salacious tabloid sounding information, right? So they were doing a lot of dot connecting, but it wasn't a dot connecting that really um, expanded your mind in a good way, right? Yeah, I mean, they, they so you know, a lot of a lot of these movements, or um, you know, if you want if you want to get people to if you want to bend somebody's will one way or the other, just insert children. Yeah, that's that's all you do. You just insert children and you can you can move them any way you want, whether it's children in cages mm -hmm. down by the border mm -hmm. uh, or, orders or whatever yeah. or, or, or kids in deep underground bunkers that are in cages and there for adrenochrome production. And I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, by the way. Yeah, that I think is probably a hidden in plain sight sort of thing. Like that's a revelation of the method so that they can then denounce those people, right? Oh, you believe, right. you believe all about that, you know, that yeah. we're just, you know, blood sucking, children blood sucking vampires, don't you? Right. But right? well, that's that Q shit, isn't it? Well, if that's what they do. They'll bring it out in the open. They'll create a straw man and, and then they'll pull it back. And when they pull it back, the people that were promoting it Will be made to look foolish. That's what they did with communism. Yep. In the 1950s. Totally. Yep. So, so I'm not saying that that stuff doesn't happen because I believe it does. Everything happens. Yeah. I believe it yeah. does. But if you build like a philosophical or intellectual currency on that, like that's 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 a that's a risky that that's that's a risky foundation. Absolutely. And, and the amount of time people spent sort of in that endeavor, in that consumption, in that pursuit, right? Like they're never getting that time back and it didn't actually really go anywhere, right? And I understand, I mean, I have definitely spent my fair share of hours swimming around at the bottom of rabbit holes galore, right? And, um, you know, maybe just the practice from all those priors told me that this one wasn't my rabbit hole, you know? Um, but by the time this one came around, um, but, you know, I, I, I think, you know, 
I'm, I hope, you know, a lot of people in our community they got caught up in this, right? And I think that there are um, opportunities right now to expand, um, for, for mind expansion, um, expansion of understanding and uh, awarenesses of things going on in our reality that can actually become very meaningful and purposeful in people's lives. And I think that like, I'm hoping that people can move on from this instead of continuing to scrape around at the bottom of the rabbit hole, hoping for another, you know, dropping, you know, and, you know, I still like, you know, for me, I, 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 I didn't follow that stuff. So like, I didn't notice too many things disappearing from my YouTube feed. Right. But like, I it did have like a wonder about like, God, what happened to some of these characters you used to see, right? Like Jordan Sather and, and, and whatever, who were like really doing this, where did they go? So I just happened to do a certain, you know, I had a personal conversation with Jordan Sather before he, you know, jumped, he really jumped off the ledge, right? When he was first, Star was first rising around the secret space program stuff back in like 2016 or 17, right? I, I had a chat with him. So I went and took a look and he has got this Jordan TV thing. You can watch, you can watch him on live TV with a subscription. And I guess he's, you know, still on BitChute or whatever, but I was like, okay, I just want to see what's going on over there. So I just clicked on his, you know, sort of latest video. And like, it's what I call non-information. It's not misinformation or disinformation. There was no information in there. And these video, this video had 28,000 views, right? So people are still spending time. Like, I don't think we have the same luxuries of knowing what tomorrow is going to be like that we used to have before 25 days ago or something like that. It's been changing for a long time, right? But for me that like people spend their time on a daily basis, right? They're never getting that time back. And we don't know what time is going to look like in the future going forward. And I just hope, um, I hope for people's sake, you know, that, that they can, um, find something else to be as interested in that as that, that as they were in that that is actually like purposeful and meaning to like their lives in a different way you know well so i I've, I've thought about this and so why was q really successful with with people why why did it grab or why, why did it have such traction and it's the same reason why marxism has traction and the, 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 the common denominator is this idea of utopia. Yeah, yeah. Because in, in the Marxist world, you know, everything's going to be equal. Everybody's going to have, you know, plenty. There's going to be plenty of resources for everybody. You're going you're gonna to have great health care. There's going to be no competition. So people won't have to steal anything. And it's all going to be, you know, based on, you know, this dream right. that the government was going to apportion everything equally and nobody will go without, right? That, you know, for a lot of people in say the 1930s coming out of, coming out of the depression, like that was really attractive to a lot of people. Yeah. You know, they thought, wow, this is, this is, well, in fact, yeah. I, I actually saw a video of a guy who left America because he couldn't get any work. And he thought that Russia was going to be, a Soviet Union was going to be a better place for him. So he got a trade, he learned to be a welder, and he went to Germany, and then he got a visa for to Russia, and said, hey, I'm here, I know how to weld, put me to work. And they stuck him in this fucking smelting factory, power plant smelting factories, all in one in a place called uh, Mag 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 Magnikorsk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And it looked like hell on earth and his life sounded like hell on earth. And, and he went there because he was following this kind of idea of this utopia. And when he got there, it was really anything but utopia. It was, it was, and he was there for five years and it's a really, uh, it's a really enlightening video. Now on the Q side, there's another version of utopia, you know, it's, it's the Gassara stuff. Yeah. Oh, we're going to have this currency and it's going to be completely tr transparent and they're going to release free energy. And you know, this is going to usher in the golden age. Trump is going to you know, run the, the new Republic, no longer the corporation of the United States. And we're going to get all these goodies, right? All these goodies that people like Charlie Ward and Charlie freak and uh, Robert David Steele and Simon Parks are all just banging the drum for this thing. 
and it's the utopia piece. It's like people want something to aspire towards and dream towards. And that's, to me, ultimately, that was the hook. Like, this is where we're going. And once these arrests happen, you know, once we get the cabal out of the way, then guess what? It's party time and we can really start living. And but that, that thing is that we have to wait to start living until that happens. Like right. people's lives have like people have lost three or four years of their life caught up in this stuff, right? And the yeah. other characteristic in which the other way that it's like Marxism is like absolutely uh like um vigilant about people who like have any like questions or opposition right oh, that's so, right. right so in with the marxism if you you know question some tactic of theirs especially question something a leader is asking you to do then you're you, you know you're must be like you know a pawn for the oppressors or you know you must want to uphold you know white supremacy or ruling class supremacy or something like that and in the q movement if you question any of the plan that you're supposed to trust then you're a hater. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It, it's it's well now now you're into kind of cult psychology. Totally. Yeah. So and, and wokeism is a cult. It is a cult. And if you if you have somebody who is woke, literally they have to be deprogrammed. Yeah. They, they have to be deprogrammed. And you know, one could make a case that uh, the Q people have to be deprogrammed as well. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't, I don't like the idea of deprogramming or re-education for anybody. I, I do believe in, in absolute freedom. I just hope for some, some of these people, right, that they find their way back to, um, a, a, you know, a pursuit that's more, um, I don't know what, holistically good for them as individuals. You know. by the by the way i don't you know things like free energy and upgrades and technology like i'm all for it oh me too i mean like i you know I'm i used to volunteer it. for cold fusion now and you know all that kind of stuff like i know that exists i know that's a possibility and i also know that if people wait for someone to release it it's never going to happen right that's, 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 that's right. not how the, the funds are never going to be released the free energy is never going to be released there, there, there's never going to be disclosure. If you fucking need disclosure at this point, if you haven't fucking had, like, if you don't have enough trust and faith in the own weird experiences you've had in your own life to know that there's something going on that, they, that people aren't telling you about, if you need like a document stamped from the government so you don't believe about anything else to tell you that aliens exist or free energy, UFO, whatever, I, I, I don't even know how to help you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like people who don't trust anything the government says are waiting for disclosure from them. Right. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah. anyway, so I don't, we, we've been going for a while here. I didn't, we didn't, we didn't hit on some of the topics that I thought we were going to. I don't know if we want to dip into one of them. We had our beanies on. So I thought maybe we should talk about Tim Pool or do, uh, Tim Pool and my, my theory sprouting up about rounds, uh, Tim Pool, or do you want to do the, the Ellison doll chart? What do you think? Well, well, why don't we talk? We can do both. We, you know, I, I want to know what your theory of Tim Pool is. All right. Okay. So, you know, you and I have been passing back and forth, both in private conversations and on AR, little theories about what went on with Tim and Adam and what's been going on with him. But, you know, Adam left and Tim, although he still lives at the same place where at, Tim does. Did you see that weird video of him? So Where's Adam he? is at Tim's place and yes, like they're, literally, they're, they're in Missouri, right? That's where they are now? They're in West Virginia. No, I don't think so. They, no, I think they're in Missouri. I think they're in West Virginia. Okay. He said he was looking at property in West Virginia. So yeah, maybe he's in Missouri, but I think he was, he lived someplace where he would have been able to get to Washington DC in a car within hours, which is not Missouri. It's what it's West Virginia. And okay. I've heard him them say a couple, I'm not hundred percent sure of this. They could be in Missouri, but I've heard them say a few other things that make me think that they're in West Virginia. I don't know. I'm not sure, but whatever it is. Right. So, but Adam is there, I think, because I saw this video of Tim pool, just walking into his studio and giving him a bottle of bourbon a few weeks ago as a gift. It's and apparently according to some people, it was a $2,000 uh, bottle of bourbon. And, and, you know, but you, I watched him walk around and hand it to him. Right. So, you know, it was like he just came into his studio while he was doing a show with Carlin Borsenko. Right. So he's still either in the same exact same location or certainly somewhere local. So 
there's something, there's some kind of media compound or something that people are all living at, right? So for a few weeks after Adam, it was kind of like just him and Lydia and they brought this Ian guy in and, and I'm sorry, but for me, Ian and Lydia are duds. Sometimes Ian says something interesting, but he doesn't actually know that much about a lot of the sort of critically important topics to understand if you're making the kind of videos that, that Tim does and I, the Lydia thing doesn't work for me at all, right? So there was something missing from the show in they bring Luke Radowski, right? And of course, of course, Luke Radowski, so Luke Radowski now lives with Tim. He lives in his RV in the parking, in the, in the driveway, right? He's been there for a couple of months now. And Luke Radowski and Tim Poole, they got to know each other at? Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street. And while we knew a little bit about Luke Radowski before then, he wasn't really, a, but he and Tim Poole both really made their names with the live reporting and live streaming from Occupy Wall Street. Right. So I think that Luke has been brought in to give Tim some credibility with the conspiracy community. Right. And, you know, I think that the switch was made at a certain, I, I think when Adam got pulled was when the decision had been made that there was going to be no Trump. Right. So that there was going to be no Trump. And, you know, Tim had sort of switched far enough over to the Trump kind of area that he kind of could have some credibility with those folks. But you know, Luke balances out, Luke will go into certain areas. He says things that Tim won't say, right? Yeah, yeah. And he's he does, and, and a lot of the things that Tim, that, that Luke Radowski says is right, but he does have some unusual connections in his background, right? But both these two got their, their star, they, they became stars at Occupy Wall Street. I have seen multiple articles uh, in alternative news, including on RT, during this thing that has gone on over the past week with the GameStop, that this is going to be the rise of Occupy Wall Street too. Yep. yep right. Yep, and yep. I've heard them talking about it like they're pushing this idea, right? And this is, um, I've heard about, you know, this is going to be like the new sort of uh, crypto or economic uh, Arab Spring in the United States kind of thing, right? And think about this like Tim Pool, I, I had never heard of Tim Pool before Occupy Wall Street. Right. And then he won like he's won tons of journalistic awards and he has worked at every single news media outlet. Right. That was supposed to be alternative, but then turned out to just become a tool of the establishment. And every time it's like, he's like, yeah, I left because they became a tool of the establishment. I think he was there to make them into a tool of the establishment. When I used to live in New York City in, you know, 2003, 2004, like Vice, Vice Magazine and Vice was, was pretty edgy. Now, one could be said that this thing was always set up to create false culture or like have a stock in kind of stuff, right? But they weren't doing, they weren't like openly opposing things that are like alternative views, right? And they were, they were doing more interesting stuff. Now it's just literally, uh, you know, a media tool for, you know, wokeness with fucking big oversized glasses and stupid ugly clothes and shit like that, right? So Tim Pool was at Vice, he was at Fusion. He's always done this like, you know, go work at this place that's supposed to be edgy, bring this live, like active reporting from the ground in controversial places. But, you know, you can go back and listen to um, uh, people who like were in the conspiratorial movement who would try to approach Tim after his star got, he was sort of reasonable at Occupy Wall Street, but after his star had been raised and he was working at Vice, if any of these people who were from some sort of more conspiratorial, alternative leaning kind of belief would try and approach him, he'd ignore them. He'd walk away, he didn't want to talk to them. You know what I mean? He was there to, you know, do something else, right? And he's always, I mean, if you think about it, he's been at all these spots that were, and all of these energy points that were pivot like pivot points in the way something was going, right? And one could say that that's a sign of a great street reporter, or one could say that that's something, that that's a certain type of um, agent provocateur or manufacturing of consent or, or some kind of steering of information in a very particular way. And even though they really theoretically don't agree on anything, he and Luke Radowski have maintained their friendship over these years, which I think is great. I think it's great to have friends that you disagree with, right? But to me, it seems like now Q is gone, so they need another movement, another psychological operation to wrap people up in, and they can't, the, uh, the psychological operation can't come from the same people that Q came from, or from the same people that Black Lives Matter and Antifa came from, because that was another psychological operation conducted by a different wing of the same funding class, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah. Thing. 
Occupy Wall Street, and they're talking constantly about how, look, this is going to bring the left and the right together, right? This is going to bring the sort of conspiratorial community and the anti-war or the, you know, whatever, the anti-Wall Street left together. So this is the synthesis, right? We've experienced thesis and antithesis with Q and Black Lives Matter and Antifa and blah, 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 blah. So now we're going to have new Occupy Wall Street too as the synthesis, right? And, um, you know, Luke Radowski and uh, Tim Poole are here to sort of usher that in. And there was even this weird moment where like he, the three of them, the two of them were together with Alex Jones, right? Who Tim Poole supposedly has always disliked, but now has on his show regularly. And who Luke Radowski supposedly has um, a contentious relationship. You know, he used to work for him and then had a contentious falling out in relationship with. But I'm telling you, there's at least one, a portion of their paycheck, in my opinion, that's signed by by the same person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I didn't really know a whole lot about Tim Pool. Um, he used to uh, send me stuff. I, I did see the thing with him and he was on Rogan and we've talked about that and how he disassembled the Twitter people, which was great. Right. Uh, and I didn't really know a lot about Tim Pool. And you know, I, I, didn't, I, I think he would send me something every now and then, but he started to show up in my feed um, over the summer. So I started to watch him. And that's when I said to you, I said, Tim Pool is the new Alex Jones for Trump. Totally. And and then you said, because you stopped watching him or you weren't really tuned into him at that I was time. Bored, yeah. And then you started to watch him and it's like, holy shit, you're right. He was he was the new Alex Jones. It was his job to galvanize people around Trump because Trump wasn't the through the mindless uh bullying left right that's it's like let's establish who the left are and let's look at who trump is he is not that he's not that so when i started to see that and again i didn't know a lot about tim pool my first thought is this guy's a spook like tim tim pool is intel yeah i mean tim, he, yeah He's intel. He's a spook, he, and, mm -hmm. and and he is somebody that is kind of a nodal point, and they can move things through him. Yeah, right? they, can, they can move things through him. I used to hang out with not not you know like I mean a lot of people who are arrested now sat in his the chair sat in his the chair in his studio in the weeks leading up to the in the weeks leading up to the activity in Washington, D.C. Sat in his studio. Did they, did they arrest Jack Murphy? Brandon Strzok, Enrique, Enrique Tarez. Oh, uh, Enrique, Enrique Tario. Tario, yeah. The, the, um, now, talk, that guy's an informer. Right. That guy, that guy was an informer. Right. He had deep ties to the FBI, and he had infiltrated. He had infiltrated the Proud Boys. And by the way, the Proud Boys came out of Gavin McGinnis, who started, yes. who started Vice Magazine. Who started Vice, right? And in in, in, in some ways, it occupies a similar space in certain ways as, 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 as some of these characters. But I'm curious, I, you know, I, I never, I didn't necessarily have a funny feeling about Brandon Strzok, right? Like I find what he was doing basically annoying and whatnot, but he had some fair points that are satisfying to hear, hear said and whatever. But I started to become suspicious of him when I heard when I found out the details about Ali Alexander. You know who Ali Alexander is, don't you? Yeah. Do you know his story? Well, I know that he got inserted very quickly into the Stop the Steal thing and brought all these people together: Jack Posobiec, Brandon Straka, and uh, I know he's got, he's got like a minor criminal past. Um, like he's like, there's a mug shot of him. So but he, he was somebody that just like all of a sudden popped onto the scene. So I, I cannot, this is what I heard, right? Like, you know, we have some interesting conversations at Conspiracy Cocktail, right? And so I'm not saying, I am not saying that this is the truth, but this is what I heard and it made me start to think, right? I heard that, you know, he had been arrested in like 2007, 2008 kind of period of time. And then again, a little bit later, and somehow after that, he sort of became involved in maybe an un, inappropriate kind of way with some um, neocon or Republican kind of characters. 
and ended up getting uh, some dirt on some of them. And then from there has been a sort of an, an asset or a disruptor or a shit starter in a lot of these kinds of you know, theoretically right-wingy kind of movements, right? Like maybe he's a brownstone or he collects information on people. But, you know, he came into my awareness um, maybe a little over a year ago, right? On a channel that was like having like a lot of like Scott Adams videos and stuff like that, right? And suddenly it had like video of this guy. And I'm like, dude, what? He's not even saying anything that has any content, right? It felt like he was just the person who was trying to ride like the Candace Owens kind of train right? Like, because he was a person of color and now he's, a, you know, a Trump supporter or whatever, right? And and then I find that, you know, apparently, I, I guess he didn't start the Stop the Steal movement, but he took it over, right? Yeah. You know? And so, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I've never had any funny feelings about Brandon Strzok, Brandon Strzok but he, they, he showed up about in this scene scenario, like about a year before Ollie, Ollie uh, Alexander sort of did. And, you know, I, 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 I think that maybe they were the tools or assets. For sure, Ollie Alexander seems to be working as an informant or some sort. Oh, he, yeah. So yeah, I, told, I totally agree. I, I, we have to wonder about Brandon Strzok, too. When I, when I first saw the Brandon Strzok video, it rang totally false to me. Mm -hmm. Totally false. That, yes, but in terms of like, I didn't see him doing shady stuff. Like it just felt contrived. It felt like it somebody- felt totally contrived. It felt totally to ride contrived. The Cannon wave. Totally, like, per, totally produced. Yep. And I remember somebody, a, a friend of mine who I used to work with, uh, sent me the video and, and I said, I'm not buying this guy. Well, and I also, I don't buy these people who like leave the left and go immediately to the right. That doesn't make sense to me. Right, that the only option when you leave the left is to joyfully embrace the right. They jo they like became like Trumpists to the hill, right? Like I can see like if you got someone like James Lindsay who's begun to question his own side, and he was sort of very um, you know uh, reluctantly supporting Trump, right? Just because it seemed more sane and it would buy us a few more years than right. Biden won, right? But when you go when you see somebody who two weeks ago was like a uh, diet in the world Democrat. And then suddenly they're like, not just supporting Trump, but they're leading all of the movements to try and pull people over that. I mean, I, I was always suspicious of that. Like, where's the person who like, hey, maybe the political system is the problem, right? Why is it always, it's just the Democrats or the Republicans are the problem, let's go to the other side. So whenever I see that I'm suspicious, but I mean, we had already seen, you know, like the rise and all the media attention that Candace Owens got and the way she's been able to catapult a career off of that, right? So I thought that was kind of what was going on with Brandon Strzok, right? But then when I found out some of this stuff about this Ollie Alexander guy, you know, and I don't know, like maybe, maybe, maybe there's something I don't know when I'm wrong or whatever, but these people were always suspicious to me and the Ollie Alexander guy is the worst of them. The other two, at least like, there was some sort of reason and content to what they were saying. The Ali Alexander guy never said anything. It was just a bunch of words with no actual, he brought no, no new insight, no new experience, and he brought nothing to the table. It was like, I couldn't understand why I was looking at his face on a video screen. So he popped into my awareness around the Stop the Seal. I'd never heard of him before. Mm -hmm. And he was a guest on, I was watching Alex Jones one day and he, he said, okay, I'm, you know, they wanted me to do this, so I'm bringing this person and this person, Jack Posobiec, uh, Mike Mike Cernovich, and that, and all these people who might have you know, ran a struck were all coordinating to stop the steal. I'm like, okay, well, maybe this is what this guy does. I don't know anything about him. Uh, and seemed like, you know, the first weekend in Washington, D.C., there was like a lot of high energy. And then he shows up and He's like deeply embedded in the InfoWars crew. And it's him wow. and o Owen Schroyer. And they're giving, Owen Schroyer's talking to people on a bullhorn. And Ollie Alexander's standing next to him and he's smoking a cigar. And there are about like five other brothers who are around Owen Schroyer. I'm like, well, this is a very interesting look for InfoWars. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the, 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 the figure that, Ali Alexander cut in that moment was almost like a mob boss. Mm -hmm. Like he had a mob boss energy, like smoking this. And he looks like Sammy Davis Jr.'s grandfather. He does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And so I'm like, I got kind of a weird vibe off of him with that. And then the next stop to steal, he had inserted himself. Mm-hmm. That's the second one, the second weekend, which was yeah. a shit show. Uh, and that's when he kind of inserted himself and kind of even took over like Alex Jones's sort of bullhorn position. Like, whoa, what's going on here? Like all of a sudden now it's becoming the Ali Alexander show. And then I don't know if you see, he did this video where he, I think it was on Twitter and, and, and they were not renting hotel rooms in DC. Right. And he came out and said, you know, do these, do these hotels, you know, 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 know who I am. You know, I'm organizing Stop the Steal. And he named three congressmen, Mo Brooks being one of them. And I'm working with these three congressmen. Like, how does that happen? So what I heard is that he's been very involved in compromising in a very not nice way. A lot yeah. of people in their Republican circles. Yeah, I, that actually makes sense. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. So whether um, he, whether he, um, whether Brennan Strzok was just an attention whore and Ali Alexander uh, got him hooked up, ca- caught up in something, and he he wasn't involved in anything necessarily nefarious, or whether Brandon Strzok is part of that sort of infiltrate the movement and compromise it thing, I don't know. Um, but I it, it it definitely when somebody uh, brought this to my attention, I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and then and what he's doing is he's basically like outing these congressmen, like, you know, yeah, I'm here. I'm here because of them. They support this idea. Right. Yeah. That's right. Like, like he, he, he dumped on those guys. Yep. In a big way. And he was really okay with it. Um, and now he's like gone dark. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? So I don't, um, yeah. And anyway, back to the sort of Tim. Oh, oh. What? Enrique Tario, real quick. Yeah. If people don't know who he is, he's he's the guy who kind of became the leader of the Proud Boys. Mm-hmm. And again, showing up on Alex Jones a lot, showing up on Tim Pool, right? Mm-hmm. These two these two nodal points. And he flies into Washington, D.C. for that third weekend, and he's arrested at the airport. Yeah. He wasn't arrested. He was extracted. He was extracted completely. He was extracted because he his cover was about to be blown, right? But they also had to, he didn't want to get arrested. He didn't want to be part of that scuffle. So they had to have a reason why he couldn't be there, right? right. I mean, th- li- absolutely, 100%. I mean, anybody who can, he pulled the old law. I don't recall anything like that. You know, the whole, by saying I don't recall, it's not exactly lying or whatever, all that shit. Yeah, no. And that person sat in Tim Pool's chair two weeks before all that shit went down. Right. Brandon Straka was there a couple of times. And so I don't know, you know, like now I'm sure that honest media people sometimes fall into the trap of having someone who's some sort of uh, agent or whatever on. I know that that's, you know, happens to people that you and I know and the people that you and I know are not in on it. You know what I mean? We, we, we know that that's happened. Um, but this this is this this Occupy Wall Street two thing is being manufactured because you have Tim Pool pushing it, you have Luke Rudowski pushing it, and who who else rose during uh, Occupy Wall Street? RT, they're pushing it. You're right, right. Remember that was when we first all started finding out about RT because they were the only ones reporting on it because the mainstream news was not. Remember? Yeah, yeah. I you know I I was there on like the third or fourth day. At Occupy Wall Street? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In New York? Yep. Huh. And what did you you think? What did you see? That was the last time that sort of right and left kind of came together because you had libertarians there sort of protesting the Federal Reserve and all that kind of stuff, right? So so I was was there twice. I I think the first time I, I was there was like on a Wednesday. It was in October. And, and then I went back on Saturday. And by Saturday, it had completely changed. Mm-hmm. It, had complete, it had been taken over by the left. Yep. And in the first three to four days, it was this interesting sort of stew of libertarians and 
sort of, you know, class aware activists. And, it, you know, it was, it was, I'll tell you, they, it was very sophisticated. They had a group of young people all on brand new apples. Yep. All streaming live. They had, they had power, big, big generators, right? This was very organized, very, very organized. And it's like, wow, this is, this is interesting. And you could tell that it was not like random, like, Hey, let's just show up and stream. Like they were, they were doing shit. Yeah. And I don't know if Tim pool was a part of that or not. I, I don't, I don't know if he was part of that, that group. I think, I think that group came out of that, uh, that magazine was Ad, 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 Busters. Ad, Ad, Ad Busters. Busters, Ad Busters. I think that was the Ad Busters group. Yeah. And they had a lot of that kind of repetitive mockingbird chanting going on. Yeah, it's all that like Gene Sharp kind of stuff, Color Revolution kind of stuff. This all was like, all this was yeah. all Color Revolution. Yeah. Like it's fun. There's drumming, and you know, it, there is there is definitely like there was a buzz. It's like wow, this is this is interesting. By Saturday, it had all changed. The left had taken over. They were leading a march on the uh, <laughs> up, on the on the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah, uh, they got arrested, and I was and I was with my buddy Lawrence, and this march thing was 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 happening. And I'm like, "What do you think, man? You want do you want to go on this march or not?" I'm, I said, "I'm not really into it. I'm not into it either." And they all got arrested, right? So they all got arrested. This is um, you're you're explaining them. So I live I was living in downtown during this period of time, and, and shortly within you know a few days to a week or two of it popping up in New York, it popped up in most major cities, including downtown Los Angeles, right? So it was, I, I could literally walk from my apartment to over where the encampment was. And, you know, maybe I, I, a few days into it, I, I went over there. I think my mom was visiting and we decided to go over and check it out, right? And it was kind of interesting, right? There was some some stuff that, you know, like, okay, this is like, seems more like a festival than it does any kind of like protest or demonstration or whatever. But there was interesting stuff. Like there was tables where they were doing book exchanges. People could come and read and stuff like that. But there was also people sleeping in tents and, you know, there was all sorts of stuff going on. There was artists there doing live paintings of stuff. And I, I talked to this artist who I had seen the week, like a few weeks before on Alex Jones and, you know, whatever. And, um, you know, like me and my mom kind of talked about it. And like, I was like, eh. I don't know. I was she, was, she was like, about what we thought about it. And I was like trying to decide if it was something I wanted to go get involved in or not. And I was like, eh, I don't know, dude, like, like, these people don't seem very occupied or occupying to me. Like, they seem like they're just there smoking pot, doing whatever. Like, they don't feel, doesn't feel like they've occupied their mind with any, you know, important idea or, or any knowledge that, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I wasn't sure. So a few days later, I walked back again by myself. And this time it was like you said, completely different. It was just like, seemed more like, um, you know, a place where there had been like a, an outdoor raid going on for two days. And there was like, you know, people laying around smoking pot, drunk, you know, like not really super with it. And I was like, eh, not for me. Right. And then started all of the like marching in the middle of the night and the demonstrations in the, in the intersections and well, the sirens and the police. And after a while, I just didn't, this went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I was like, get these people out of the fucking neighborhood. Right, like it just wasn't even, um, yeah. It, it, something very, very much changed in those first sort of, you know, yeah. few yeah. weeks and whatnot. But um, you know, it certainly provided um, the uh, pretext for a lot of, um, you know, cracking down. There was, we saw a lot of rubble bullets, a lot of, you know, the uh, sound weapons, a lot of tear gas, a lot of that kind of stuff. And you know, like they, they, they're always needing reasons to do that, right? Um, so, and they'd like to shut down the right and left and they'd like to do it together. <laughs> right. Kind of thing. <laughs> so. My, my, so, so when this GameStop thing mm -hmm. started, one of the first things I said, and I think I said it this week, I said, this is Occupy Wall Street. Yep. This is Occupy Wall Street 2.0. This is, this is what's happening now. And Tim and Luke aren't going to be on the street this time. They're going to be there in the basement or wherever they are at, at the compound, right? Talking about it, talking about this stuff every night and, and whatnot. And this is going to become like the main part, the main content that they're focused on for the next period of time. So it's the, you know, it's 10 years later or eight or nine years later and our technology has changed 
and they don't want us living in the real world anymore. They want, so it's going to be on Zoom like everything else, right? Like, the, you know, there might be a few people out there protesting um, on the street, but mostly it's, I think we're going to go into this period of people doing wild, control, seemingly wild, but truthfully and probably controlled with maybe a few random things that aren't controlled, actions on the stock market and in the cryptocurrency markets and all that kind of stuff that's going to give the pretext for cracking down and having to have, you know, digital ID to participate in the economy online in various ways, internet 2.0 that you have to be approved to participate or pay to participate in, you know, uh, barriers on the way into and out of crypto markets and things like that. And, and this is and, and just just like, you know, they started to have, crack down on the street before and occasionally there'll be a street protest and that'll give them a reason to crack down that way too. Right. But they want to deploy a more controlled Internet. And this is going to be the thing that takes us there. I totally agree. Totally, totally agree. Um, my my theory about who was behind Occupy Wall Street was Obama. Obama was behind Occupy Wall Street. Yeah. That, that was that was a social action yeah that and and I, and I said that to people I said I think I think Obama's behind this and the same people are behind this we're getting yeah. this one yeah. week into the Biden administration yeah okay. and, and they thought oh this is nuts it's not good for Obama I said no it's it's great for Obama are you kidding me and, and well if, by the end of Occupy Wall Street the message was vote for Democrats so it was great for Obama right and so I looked at who actually owned Zuccotti Park. Like, it doesn't belong to the city. Right. There's actually somebody who owns Zuccotti Park, and I believe one of the buildings across the street. And that person leads, I forget who they are, but they had a, a group, like a financial group that was based out of, I think, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, deep donor connections and ties to Obama. Yep. Right. So just you're just linking the landlord from Occupy Wall Street to like a major Obama donor. And this is the this is an update of the same kind of shit that Bill Ayers used to do, the same kind of actions and movements and that, you know, all of that, the kinds of things Obama was involved in when he was in college and, and whatnot. And and this is an updated version of that, right? Right. It, now I will say this that Astrologically, this is part of the zeitgeist with Aquarius. Totally. And they know that. And they know that. Yeah. Yeah. And they do know that. They absolutely yeah. know that. Um, yeah. So here we are. And we get to watch this thing roll out. I, I guess they tried to take on silver. Mm -hmm. And that was, and like they got their ass beat on silver. Yeah. That, that you, that, like that's a market that, some of the, the best people in the world, you know, some of the smartest guys in the room have tried to corner that market and they can manipulate the spot price yep. any, any way they want. Any way they want. Any all way the, they want. Yeah. All so there, there was all yeah. this, you know, massive physical buying of silver, right? It was like the madness of crowds. And the more silver that was bought, the spot price went down further. Yep. <laughs> and people are going nuts. I was hoping the price of silver would go up because I have some that I bought last time, so like oh, many years back, right? And it's been done nothing but lose value. And so I was hoping to at least come back up to even, but I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think, <laughs> I think that the, the, the most it's been is like high 30s, low 40 an ounce. Yeah. But generally, it hovers around $25 an ounce. Yep. 25. Sometimes it's down as low as 17. Yeah. I've had, you know, so yeah. Silver, by the way, silver is lunar. It's a lunar metal. Yeah. Right? It's 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 reflective. Yeah. And it's the color of like the full moon. It's silver. Yep. Gold is a solar metal. Yeah. And when you get into silver, you get into you know lunacy and madness and um you know, it's in this is what we're seeing. We're seeing this kind of yep. um, this lunacy. Yeah. yeah, I think you're you're totally right. And they're they're trying to push this thing now. And and it, it, and even you know, but here's what's interesting. So um you you know Rod from, from our group, right? Rod Rod, the, the architect. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um 
he and his son have not agreed on anything, right? Just diametrically opposed politically. But they do agree on GameStop and silver and this, oh, look, you know, the man is fucking us over here. Yep, yep. And that's going to be, that's going to be the energy that is behind Occupy 2.0 because yeah. people haven't, who haven't agreed on anything for more than 10 or 15 years now are both going to, uh, both going to agree. And they're going to think they're involved in a real protest against the unfairness of the financial market. Like, and it's going to be controlled just like Occupy Wall Street was controlled. Right. And now we're in a classic socialist dialectic. Yeah. Right. It's not about race. It's about class, money, and the economy. Yeah, I think I, I think BLM is the I think BLM and Antifa are largely over, and it's going to be exactly that now, and it's going to be based around this wall. It's going to be a complete class struggle. Yeah, right. I agree. Yeah. So I, I will throw this out though, that they can create these like group spirits or these egregores. Egregores, yeah. They can create them, but sometimes they can't always guide them. Nope. Or put them back in the bottle. So they did that with with Q, and they did that with a lot of these people. They're not they're not going to go anywhere. They're now they're this kind of collective that's that's adrift, right? Yeah. But they're going to try to do it with this thing, and maybe some of the Q people will be brought back into, you know, this this uh, dialectic. But even if they're trying to pump it and create 2.0 and this is where we're all going to come together again that may not work out well hopefully some people who were taken either by the q movement or, to, or taken by the blm movement will start to recognize some of the same tricks being used and the same same character cast of characters being deployed and whatnot and this time they'll be a little wiser yeah yeah I, and i and i you know and i said this i this this is astroturfed some of it's organic Mm -hmm. You've got some people. It's like, hey, you know, I've got my. Have to have some organic. The people won't buy it if there's no grain of truth. There has yeah. to be something. There has to be someone. There has to be someone with true charisma that isn't controlled, like that is attached to it in some way. Otherwise, people don't buy it. But then the things that spring up, all of the other stuff that kind of pops up around it, right? The carnival that springs up around the main act, right? Yeah. Is you know, absolutely, yeah. All right, let's do this because um, we've been going for about two hours now. Let's uh, put off the Nadal Ellison chart for two weeks when we meet again, because that will land us right in the middle of the, uh, the Australian Open, right? So that's yeah. time for a little tennis talk. So let's do that and um, let's wrap up. And Robert, I just want to say, I'm, I'm glad you're feeling better. I, I was I was worried about you. You know, you're one of my, uh, um, you know, comrades and whatever this is that we're in. And I know when somebody who has as much sort of energy and force as you do goes down, it's it's a hard, it's difficult emotionally and whatever. So I'm glad you're feeling better. I'm glad you're back. Everybody loves you. Um, and uh, you know, maybe a little less time with the dark material and find something entertaining to watch once in a while. Well, you know, I do my best, and um, I try I try to, I try to filter it. You know, yeah. Try to filter as much as possible. I am watching animal videos. Good. That's always good. I'll, I'll start sending you the ones we like. Okay. You send me the ones you like, and I'll send you the ones we like. It's my, my, my latest is Ati the Otter. Who well, I've seen it. that one in my feed, but I've never clicked on it. It's good. It's pretty cute. Yeah. Ati, Ati the Otter is pretty cute. Yeah. We, we've got it. We have had some major uh, periods of like kitty videos, little elephant videos, like, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, all right. There's a, there's yeah. a woman who does uh, cat rescue. Yeah. Have you seen those videos? She's mm -hmm. got the cat rescue channel. Mm -hmm. um, she never talks. I, she doesn't live in the United States. I think she might live in somewhere in Russia or you know one of the, one of the one of the one of the Balkan countries. You could tell by the plugs. But she rescues these little these little kittens. Sometimes she rescues puppies. She rescued a fox. Oh, uh, I love it. she gets the rescue box. She, she like supports the wildlife foundation and they send little updates on the animals and the fox was so cute. There was a baby fox. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and there's, I saw this one video, this, this uh, person had a, had a pet coyote and this coyote and this cat were playing and it was like, wow, that was really cool. 
You know, yeah. which one, you, you know which ones I really like? I like the when the little husky puppies are learning to howl. Oh, I haven't seen those. I love watching that. Those are some of my favorite ones. And did you ever watch the weird cucumber cat videos? No. Oh, you have to watch that. Like, look up cats and cucumbers. That is the weirdest thing ever. <laughs> Go look up cats. It's nothing weird and sexual, don't worry. <laughs> right? Go look up cats and cucumbers. That shit's hilarious. All right, guys, that'll be it for us. You guys can find him at robertphoenix.com, which is about to become really more the hub of the media and, for, and the videos and things like that that you'll be putting out, correct? Yep. And actually, hopefully, sometime in the next few weeks, my website will finally be up and going. Wow. Somebody's helping, yeah, somebody's helping me with that. Nice. But you can always, yeah, you can find me here on YouTube and at patreon.com forward slash off planet media. And I also actually have a page on um, locals now, which is Dave Rubin's sort of platform who mm -hmm. I have some issues with Dave Rubin, but I do think he believes in free speech. And well, this will be a test. If I say something critical of some of the ideas he likes or some of the people he likes, and we'll see if he believes in free speech or not. But um, a lot of people don't like Patreon. So I wanted to offer an alternative. So you guys can find me on locals also at Emily Moyer. Awesome. Where to go, Emily? And we'll see you guys next time. All right. Good night, guys.